The Rose Revolution was a pivotal moment in Georgia's history. The events of November 2003 brought in a decade of fast-paced reforms that saw Georgia rise to become one of the world's freest economies, safest countries, and leading reformers. None of this would have been possible if it weren't for the Rose Revolution. But there is the burning question of whether the Rose Revolution was a truly grassroots people's movement aimed at ousting a corrupt regime, or if it was a coup d'etat with a fan club. The background for the Rose Revolution can be found in the decade between Georgia's independence from the USSR in 1991 and up to the revolution itself. The first president of modern Georgia, Zviad Gamsakhurdia, led the country into civil war, both over his own tenure and with the now de facto state of Abkhazia. Gamsakhurdia only lasted a few months in office before he fled the country. By this point, Georgia was on the verge of becoming a textbook example of a failed state. Gamsa Khurdia's replacement, and therefore Georgia's second president, Eduard Chavarnadze, was the Soviet Minister of Foreign Affairs from 1985 until 1991. The first years of Chavarnadze's tenure as president were marked by the Abkhaz War, near secession in Najara, three consecutive years where Georgia's economy shrank by more than 20%, and hyperinflation. To help combat this, Chavarnadze had introduced a new currency, the coupon, in 1993 with a conversion rate of 1 US dollar to 5,060 coupons. Within a few months, the exchange rate was 1 US dollar to 2,400,000 coupons. Unemployment was at a record high, and the government shed over 250,000 jobs to make up for its massive deficit. By the late 1990s and the turn of the millennia, Georgia's economy had stabilized, but was still growing at less than 3% annually. All of this meant that discontent with Shavartnadze and his political party was high. Even though there were many opposition parties and leaders, it became clear by 2002 that Mikhail Saakashvili was different. Unlike Zurab Zhvania and Nino Burjanadze, two other prominent young Georgian politicians, Saakashvili was able to stay focused during press interviews and, more importantly, showed that he had a plan to improve the Georgian economy. Saakashvili had ran his campaign on a leftist agenda. His base of supporters was the poor and elderly. He advocated for the doubling of pensions, the elimination of land taxation, and free and improved health care. Saakashvili also vowed to end the 33% tax employers paid per employee, along with ending all taxes for small businesses. Georgian society had reached its boiling point during the parliamentary elections on November 2, 2003. These elections were marred with mismanagement from all sides. The first major issue with the elections was voter fraud, thanks to huge waves of immigration during the 1990s. Georgia's voter registry was outdated, with thousands of individuals who weren't even living in Georgia listed on the voter registry. Shavarnadze ordered the Central Election Commission to create a new registry, but the new one was just as bad as the old one, with entire households missing and many names appearing repetitively, even in the same precinct. On the day of the election, many polling stations opened late, notably in Kutaisi and Zugdidi. By 11 in the morning, the Central Election Commission announced that the polls would stay open two hours later than scheduled and would even allow voters who worked on the registry to vote simply by showing an ID that had their residential address in the voting precinct. Georgian media only inflamed the situation. The Georgian media's justified focus on electoral violations and general mismanagement created an environment for the Georgian people to lose faith in their government's ability to conduct a free, fair, and legitimate election. What's more, the media had relied heavily on its own self-conducted polls to get information to voters. One television station had been announcing its own exit polls while the polls were still open and allowed Saakashvili to declare himself the victor of the elections. The worst part of this is that the exit polls that had been aired were vastly inaccurate, giving Saakashvili's party, the national movement, a nearly 9-point lead over the runner-up, while in reality it only had a 5-point lead. Despite this, Saakashvili had correctly noted during a press briefing that those currently in power got about 18% of the vote. The media had also failed to hold opposition leaders accountable for their false claims. For example, during a protest that occurred on November 13th, 
an opposition leader accused Shavat Hadze of being responsible for the 9th of April tragedy, despite many independent investigations showing that Shavat Hadze was unaware of the incident. And when he did find out about what happened in Tbilisi, he resigned from his post as a Soviet foreign minister out of anger. Saakashvili, Zhvania, and Burjanadze were attending the protest and let this lie go unscathed, as did Georgian media. Finally was the situation in Achara, which was ruled by Aslan Abashidze, a strongman leader who had ruled the region like his own personal fiefdom. On November 6th, Achara had announced the results of its elections. Abashidze claimed that his own party, Revival, received 95% of the vote. Shevardnadze, fearing that Achara would break away like Abkhazia, chose not to confront Abashidze and instead placated him. The Georgians were astonished that their own president treated Abashidze more like a boss than a widely loathed despot. On November 17th, Abashidze had sent thousands of his supporters to the PDC to call for stability. Simultaneously, Nino Burjanadze and Mikhail Saakashvili's supporters were in the streets protesting the election results as well. In order to appease the protesters, Shavartnadze convened a special parliamentary session to occur on November 22nd. The session, however, almost never happened because the opposition parties realized that there was no point in holding a special session since they all agreed that the election's results were fraudulent. With just minutes to spare before a quorum was due, Shavartnadze had agreed with an opposition party that the election results would be nullified and a new election would be held within months. During Shavatnadze's opening address to the parliament, opposition leader Nino Borjanadze's and Mikhail Saakashvili's followers stormed the parliament building, complete with television crews accompanying them. As they entered parliament, they were holding roses. Nino Borjanadze was the first to enter the parliament chamber where Shavatnadze was speaking, but she was closely followed by Saakashvili, who entered, shouting, Gadadis, 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 resign, resign, resign. As Saakashvili and his supporters were making their way towards the front of the chamber, security guards removed Shavatnadze from the parliament building and whisked him away. Shortly after other opposition leaders left the parliament building, Saakashvili drank from Shavatnadze's cup of tea and told Burjanadze that she should take her place as Speaker of Parliament. In the meanwhile, Saakashvili's supporters took over the state chancellery building. That evening, Shavatnadze, speaking from his private residence, declared a state of emergency and stated that he would use force if necessary to deal with protesters. Upon hearing this, Russian President Vladimir Putin sent in Russia's foreign minister, Igor Ivanov, to help mediate a solution between Saakashvili and Shavatnadze. Saakashvili and his supporters agreed that Shavatnadze was to hand in a letter of resignation post dated for the summer of 2004. However, during the night of November 22nd, just hours after his parliamentary session was stormed, Shavart Nadze announced his immediate resignation. There are many questions and theories regarding the storming of parliament on November 22nd, such as why Saakashvili had stormed parliament when Shavart Nadze was going to nullify the elections and hold a new one, why Shavart Nadze resigned immediately, why the media chose to circulate inaccurate polls and information to the public, and why the media favored Saakashvili and Burjanadze over Shavartnadze and other opposition leaders. Unlike other pro-democracy revolutions, Georgia's Rose Revolution wasn't a movement against an authoritarian regime. Rather, it was a coup against a failed state at best and an unpopular administration at worst. Instead of finding a constitutional remedy to the Shavartnadze administration's failings, Saakashvili and the opposition sought to overthrow the government. The Rose Revolution, if viewed in this manner, could be considered a popular coup rather than a revolution. On the contrary, there was little reason to think that new elections would be more reliable or well administered than the previous ones. The Shavatnadze administration attempted to create new voter registers, but failed miserably. Shavatnadze attempted to reform the Georgian economy, but had to gut the entire Georgian government in order to do so. Shavatnadze attempted to integrate Georgia's minorities but only led to the secession of Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and nearly Ajada as well. And to add insult to injury, Shavatnadze ended up taking orders from a local wannabe feudal lord rather than following his own country's law. 
If you'd like this, Shavuot Nadze's administration had shown itself woefully incapable of governing and performing even the most basic functions, and an immediate change of regime was the only way forward. A third way to view the Rose Revolution is that, even though Shavuot Nadze was Georgia's president, his inability to govern made Georgia a country without a government, meaning that there was no government to have a coup against. As such, the Rose Revolution was the outcome of the most popular, or least despised, leader filling in a power vacuum. Even though the supporters of the Rose Revolution itself were consigned to Saakashvili and Burjanadze's parties, there seemed to be a broad consensus in Georgian society during this time that some sort of change was necessary. Regardless of interpretation, the Rose Revolution created a new era in Georgian society. The country began to progress. Its economy grew by double digits for nearly a decade. Even through the 2008 recession and up to present day, Georgia continues to have economic growth rates above 4%, quadruple the European average. Corruption has markedly decreased to the point to where Georgia is now seen as less corrupt than most of the EU's southern and eastern members, and despite the fact that poverty and unemployment remain a major problem in Georgia, the country is now at a manageable state. It is undoubted that Georgia is better off now than it was before the Rose Revolution, and in this sense, the Rose Revolution has fulfilled its promises. For more information about Georgia, visit our website www.visiting-georgia.com. Thanks for watching.